Last week I entitled my message Hungry Eyes and it was a spin-off from the previous week when I was absent and things were well looked after here and I do appreciate the many who can step up to the plate and we don't skip a beat at all. Uh, but in my absence, uh, as my mind is forever turning and thinking and just seeking the mind of the Lord, doesn't matter what you do, whatever, we won't go there. Unless you've been there, you wouldn't understand, perhaps. So I came home with this burning thing in me about hungry eyes, and, and, and I've seen it from a hunter's perspective. So those of you who weren't here, I, I, I was gone hunting, and, and, and it just came so clear to me how from a hunter's perspective, how you have hungry eyes and you're forever looking, forever discerning, forever picking apart a bush, a stump, a rock, uh, or the fuzz on top of a moose's head looking for antlers. Hungry eyes. And, you know, from a critical perspective, a person could say, well, Blankety, blankety, blank, what does that have to do with hunting anyway? What about seek and you will find? Knock and the door will be opened. Ask and it will be given. They that hunger and thirst will be filled. If you seek for me and search for me with all your heart, I will be found of you. What about those scriptures? You know, when I look at my message this morning and, and even last week, I, I, I struggle to communicate what I feel, what I see. And it's very much like you take a picture and then you say to somebody, wow, look at this picture, look at this picture. And uh, you're thinking, ooh, that picture doesn't really, eh. you know, what I really saw, that was amazing. This here, well, whatever. And. It's kind of like how I feel about what I perceive, what I attempt to communicate. And I forgot to shut this thing off. And if it goes off while I'm preaching, you'll be entertained. Sorry. So th that's how I feel about uh, preaching often. You see something, and then the challenge is to communicate that. So I really ask for your imagination, for your heart, for your spirit to discern, to pick up what the Lord would want to communicate, what the Spirit of God would want to say. One of the realities of hunting with someone is you cannot see through their eyes. And it works this way. Often you're looking like quarter mile, half a mile, one mile, two miles, depending on what species you're after, three miles, five miles. And so we're looking and one of the guys says, I got something. And so you look and you look and I just can't, can't figure out where it is. Sorry. Okay. In front of us, 250 yards is a dead tree. To the right of that dead tree, across the valley, is a rock. 
From that rock go 11 o'clock, and there was a big dark tree there. From that tree go to 6 o'clock, and there's an open meadow. From that meadow go to 9 o'clock, and behind a tree there is something standing there. Okay, I got it. I see two elephants and a giraffe. <laughs> you don't often see those kind of animals, but it has happened. It's really hard to see through somebody else's eyes. That's how it is in the hunting world, and that's how it is in the church world. That's how it is in this church family. Somebody sees something, and it's really hard to spot. Really hard to spot. And then the person says, oh, there it is. I can see it now. I was looking in the wrong direction. There it is. And once you see it, whether it's a moose, an elk, sheep, goat, deer, whatever we're after, once you see it, you get perspective, and you can put your glasses down, put them back up, dead tree, Rock, open meadow, big bush. Oh, I got it. That's how it works when you're glassing an animal. And that's how it works when you're glassing a truth in the Word of God. Once you've got it, you've got it. If you can't see it, Sometimes a person will think they got it or they just let on that they got it. I'm talking hunting. Christians never do this. But hunters, they let on that they got it because they're kind of embarrassed. They just can't find it. And they think, well, eventually I'll get it. So they just let on that they've got it. Hallelujah. Last week we looked at a scripture in Matthew 13. It said, you'll be ever looking, never seeing. So the big question is, what are we looking for anyway? And not just what are we looking for? What are we qualified to look for? So from a hunter's perspective, if a guy is out hunting, so what are you looking for? And now you have to qualify to shoot these critters, you need a tag. You need a hunting license. So the question is, what are you looking for and what are you qualified to take? What's, what are you qualified to claim as your own? As a Christian, we can ask ourselves the same question. What are we looking for? Why did you come here this morning? Why do you identify as Christian? What are you looking for? What do you qualify for?
Seriously. What are you looking for? And seriously, what do you qualify for? There's a verse in Colossians 1, 2. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. You know, there's a big, a huge gap between hikers and hunters. They're in the same environment and there is probably no likeness between a hunter and a hiker. Same environment. Zero likeness between the two. I mean, you'd have to convince me. You would have, maybe their shoes, their footwear. Okay, you got me. Socks, yeah, perhaps. But I even question. No, okay, we can let that slide. You got me. Okay, they got the same shoes on, hikers. You know, in the church, our churches are filled with hikers, not hunters. Hallelujah. Anyway, so this stares me in the face, and, and I put myself here as well. I'm not talking down to anyone. I'm talking to myself. I was in the bush when this came to me. It came to me first. Three big questions that just wrestle us to the ground, get us in a chokehold, and say, answer me, answer me, answer me. First question is, are we even looking? The second question is, then what are we looking for? And the third question is, do we know what we are qualified for? Do we even know what we are qualified for? These are serious questions. <sighs> Hallelujah. You know, one of the realities of hunting is the end of the season and whether or not you filled your tag. And I prefer to hunt with guys who shoot first and ask questions later. Like, how are we going to get this thing out of there? You know, it could work with a deer or a sheep or a goat. But you better have some young muscles on your side if it comes to an elk or a moose. But casting all wisdom aside, shoot first, deal with it later. How desperate are you? How desperate? I can't handle wimps. I don't do that well. We can talk about scars and bust up bones some other time, but for now, I'll just say I'm not into that sort of stuff. So we shoot first and ask questions later. That's how the West was won. 
And that's how the church was built. How desperate are we? How desperate are we? How desperate are we? You know, for many people in this community who may never go to a church, it's the end of the season for them. And if we don't deal with them, outside of these hours we're here this morning, how desperate are we? You know, this, this is really is an inexhaustible topic because this covers everything that as Christians we hold dear. Whether it's something I believe but the next person doesn't or vice versa. But everybody holds our beliefs, our doctrines, our teachings very tenaciously. Hallelujah. You know, in the hunting world, there's something called a road hunter. There are several categories of hunters. One of them is a road hunter. Now, those are stricken with age. Yep, we leave room for those boys to be running the roads and hoping to bump into something. But if a young fellow is running the roads, yeah. Pretty much what the hunting community thinks of them. How desperate are we? How desperate are we? Are we hunters or hikers? I've, I've had a few experiences in the Lord where you know, when I read about Jacob and he had that encounter with God and he seen this ladder extending up to heaven and angels were up and down. Or when Stephen, uh, when he was stoned in, in, in the New Testament and he looks up and he saw something. He saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father. I, I've never had that kind of a, a deal going on. But I've seen or, or been a part of situations several times where I think or, or I wonder, was that like something like that? Was that sort of like what happened to Stephen? And I, I seen it twice. Once when Jim Baker was released from prison, just happened to be at a conference in the States, quite coincidental, and nobody knew that he would be there. And I just don't know even how to explain this. You would think this was acted, that there was a prompt and everybody responded, but very humiliated and very shamed when he got up to say something, when he was asked to say something. And he said the words, I didn't think I could be forgiven. I don't know how to explain this, but 
3,000 people just erupted instantly as if, like, if you would drop a match into a container of gasoline. How it, not diesel, not kerosene, gasoline, how it just exploded. And with, as one man, everybody just roared in saying, you're forgiven. We hold no ought against you. I don't know how to explain that. And it happened another time. Totally different setting. I think we... Something happened. I don't know how to explain that. Something opened. And... And the second time, again, as one person, there was just such a roar. And we echoed back what, what heaven was thinking, what, what God's plan was, what his thoughts were. And so when I'm looking, and I think, I'm looking so far, and I think I, think I see something. I think I see something. Look over here. I think I think I got something. So it really comes down to <laughs> whether it's us walking out our Christian experience or whether we're packing a rifle and a tag in our pocket and it's the end of the season or the beginning of the season. It doesn't really matter, but things do ramp up a bit come the end of the season. How badly do we want it? So some years ago, in our lifetime, there was a, an outpouring. And, and I want to just show a wee little clip here of a person who just had an amazing healing but I remember one night, revival hadn't been going on probably, I'm guessing, six weeks to less than two months. And it was a Tuesday night. The place was slam-packed with people. And Lyndall began to worship, and he was in deep worship. And usually in that deep worship, it wasn't focused on anybody. It wasn't focused on the choir. It wasn't focused on anybody. Nobody was in a hurry. It just the glory of God came in. You could feel that heat come in. But I remember there were people standing all down the front. <clears throat> and there was a woman down there. I remember she started screaming bloody murder. Well, I'm the type guy that even though we're in revival, if you're going to scream bloody murder in my church, you need a good excuse. <laughs> so I looked at her and she wasn't looking at me at all. She's looking at her husband like... <sighs> Like this, you know? And I'm thinking, okay, okay, everything's cool. <laughs> and then Lendl's continuing on with the worship, and then this lady starts stomping and playing. <laughs> like that, you know. So I told Steve, I said, I'm going to go check it out. <laughs> so I got a handheld microphone, and I went down there to where she was, and she never saw me coming, didn't care that I was coming. She was staring at her husband. Her husband was a Vietnam vet that served in Vietnam. And one night they was all in the tent and they threw a grenade in on him. And he picked the grenade up to throw it. And he did throw it partially, but it exploded in midair and blew part of his hand off. His hand was growing back. I said his hand was growing back. I saw it. I did, I saw it. And it, it, was, it was the most amazing thing. It was, wow. see, when it, when it blew part of his hand off, it blew the meat off his fingers and he had just really bones up there. And it blew a big moon in this part of his hand, blew the thumb way off. And when I got there, she was, ah! <laughs> like that. And when I walked up and saw it, I said, ah!
We scream, we scream for Jesus. <laughs> but I, here's what I saw. I saw, it looked like, it was the strangest thing, but it looked like some kind of a invisible something. It looked like something was just whip stitching flesh back on his fingers. Just whip stitching, invisible, like a, an invisible laser. Just like, and as I was watching it, it was almost done by the time I got there. But as I was watching it, I thought to myself, why haven't we seen this in church before? You know why? Because it's associated with the glory. I believe the creative miracles are associated with the glory. And when that got through, the, the meat that came on that man's fingers and his thumb and his hand on the backside matched his tan exactly. And the meat underneath his hand was pink and it matched the rest of his hand perfectly. Hey, listen, our God don't do no junk. I said, our God does all things well. Come on, give him praise. So the big question is, how hungry are we? How hungry are our eyes? What are we looking for? Are we looking for anything? What are we qualified for? What is our hope? I submit that we are qualified for far more than we look for. Far more than we look for. Our pockets are full of tags. So let's look from this angle for a little while. Come with me, with your imagination. Let's, let's try to explore what it would be like today if the fall of Adam and Eve never would have happened. But we would be here today. So it's never happened but you are alive today. So there would be no sin, whatever it be. We have no idea what that is because it never happened, right? There's no fear. There's no discouragement. There's no illness, sickness. Our bodies are not deteriorating. Our imagination, our mind, our emotions, the depths of our soul, our inward parts, are at a heightened level that is just utterly astounding. Our giftings and abilities function at a place that that's just world changing. You know, there's a verse in Second Timothy one nine. It uses the word purpose. And that word purpose is our English word thesis. And a thesis is a searched out paper to explore and verify the authenticity and the purpose and the validity of a person, place, or thing. And there is 
a something, a paper, on your original plan, on your life, before the fall, God saw it before the fall, and that still exists. Now, I don't know if it's a hunk of paper. Maybe he's updated things and he's on the computer now. But in the mind of God, he sees you and I before the fall. And now through Jesus Christ, walking with him and letting the Holy Spirit have his way in our life, we can get on that pathway and we can begin walking towards what it would be like if the fall never would have happened. And that's where the will of God is for each one of us, the unique will of God for each one of our lives. So come with me. Let's look far. Let's look a quarter mile, a half a mile, one mile, three, five miles. And let's look and study. I think I got something here. I think I got something here. There is such hope for each person here, for each person there. There is such hope, such hope. They will never be told, okay, you see that dead tree in front of us, 250 yards? To the right of that tree is a rock. Go 11 o'clock. Go 4 o'clock. They will never hear those instructions if we, within the family of God, who sit at the feet of the Holy Spirit, if we don't get it figured out, they will never know where it is. How badly that video we've seen. How badly do we want it? How desperate are we for a move of God where we would see the most unusual miracles? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> In Isaiah 53, verse 5. Amazing prophet Isaiah was. He had so much messianic disclosure. First Peter 2, 24. Isaiah says, you will be. First Peter 2, 24 says, we are. Whether it's the issue of sickness uh, or all the other calamity happenings that can touch our lives and sometimes do, whether it's the wind or the water or the fire or the earthquake or the accident or the sickness, I, I find it just weird that Christian people have a, have a doctrine that says God's bad. Oh, in his wisdom, it's supposed to be good, but really God's bad. Really. And that they use even scripture to back up to prove that God's bad, like uh, the book of Job. <laughs> My Bible just fell open to it. That, that's a favorite book to prove God's bad. 
and, and there's other scriptures. I'll be the first to admit some things are difficult to understand. And I'll be the first to admit I've prayed prayers that were not answered. But that I should, on my failure, come up with the doctrine that because I failed, God is bad. I just don't know how to underscore the fact that that is so wrong. And in my mind, that is utterly weird. There's a lot of other words out there that could help give color to <laughs> this thing. Whatever. I don't think we need to give more color to it. I personally think that's weird. It's wrong. That my shortcomings should define a doctrine that says there's something wrong with God. If we go, oh, please hear this. Please hear this. Don't, don't perpetuate this thing. I, I, I just hear the Lord saying, hear this. It's as simple as this. If it was not there before the fall happened, and if it is not in the scheme of God after this is all over, i.e. heaven or the new earth, whatever that might be, if it was not there and it will not be there, please, this is not rocket science. When Adam and Eve messed up, Eve said, it was the serpent. Adam said, it was the woman. Oh God, it was you. You created the woman. Like nobody wanted to take responsibility. That thing is alive and well. Please. This is not rocket science. We don't have all the answers. And we'll never pretend that we do. This is not rocket science. If it wasn't in the beginning, and it won't be in the end. Hallelujah. So I invite you, throw up your glasses. Look off afar and study the hillside. Study the hillside of this truth. <laughs> and everyone, everyone. Whether it's that miraculous healing we just seen, and there were many in that revival, and that revival is not that old. It was during our lifetime. And we'll see another one next week of a different revival. How desperate are we? Are we hunters? Or are we hikers? Are we Sunday Christians? Or are we everyday Christians? It challenge me, challenges me that when I read of Jesus, how people would go to him and say, can you help me? They would walk for days just to find him, get on his trail. Like they didn't have phones in those days. They didn't have GPS tracking. They would have to find where he is somewhere in the land of Israel and then figure out what town he's in. Well, if he's in Israel, he's in some town. Figure out what town he's in. Track him down and say, hey, my daughter is dying. Can you come to my house? You know what challenges me about that? When's the last time somebody came to my house? 
because I have a reputation of helping people. And they said, hey, I got a problem. Can you come heal my daughter? Like, whoa, throw up your glasses. Whoa, we need to study this one. We need to study. Well, only if we're desperate. Only if we're desperate. Only if we're a hunter, not a hiker. A hiker, believe me, I don't want to say they're losers. But they are not hunters. They are not hunters. Well, because they're hikers. They, they don't, right? I'm not putting them down. I'm not putting them down. We all enjoy a nice stroll in the woods. But there's a huge difference between strolling in the woods and being very focused with hungry eyes. Yeah. And so it is with you and I. Hallelujah. Yeah, I don't want this to be a heavy. <laughs> I would have missed the mark if it would if it would be left that way, but you know, we are all called. We all have a purpose. There is a destiny there's a thesis on every person every person and we have no idea how healed we could be we have no idea how we could be a blessing to others it doesn't matter where we're at in our journey whether it's you or I I can speak for myself, I've come a tremendously long ways from the dark days of my youth with no concept that one day I would stand here and flash a Bible or have some scribbling on a hunk of paper and try to communicate a truth. We have no idea what it means that we are called and that we have an original purpose stamped on our life. And if we would just say, yes, Lord, and stop the games, if that applies, whatever, and, <laughs> and just come clean and figure out the difference between hiking and hunting, just being a casual Christian in name only and being a hardcore Christian. Wow, whatever. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I've stepped on your toes. My apologies. But there is truth to what I say. Balance it out. Let it apply to your life. But just know that there is a difference between being casual, same environment, and being very focused. There is a huge difference, huge difference. And may we forever know that we are loved and that if we can get on the pathway, figuring out what the born again thing is all about, just studying it, studying it with intent and figuring out what the Holy Spirit thing is all about, And catching a glimpse of our purpose, the original purpose and plan, and just letting Lord, the Lord, just start to unveil, blossom. And just walk away from our stuff. Many have you can 
walk away from your stuff. That lost feeling, the hopeless feeling, that heavy feeling, we can walk away from that. <laughs> we can. We can. Many have and many will. Thank you, God. Hungry eyes. Hungry eyes. Hungry eyes. Hallelujah. If you're here this morning and you don't even know what born again is all about, you need to talk to somebody who knows where to find it and how to walk you through the steps and discover where it is and what it is. Get it figured out. You would want to. There is a prize awaiting. Or the whole matter of the Holy Spirit and His function in our lives. Wow, that's a huge one. That's a trophy. That's a wall hanger. That's a life changer. All the other truths of Scripture, holiness, holiness, being separated, living a, a separated life unto God. So big, so big. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray as we just cast ourselves at your feet, I pray that we will not be disappointed. But that our eyes will see the prize. That we would participate in, in heavenly glory. that we would not be disappointed. That is our prayer. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Visit us in dramatic ways as we look with hungry eyes for more. Hallelujah. 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 After a message like this, you're either encouraged or you're ripped off, you're mad. Hallelujah. Find balance where it applies to you. But the message is simple. We need to have eyes that are looking. We need to have hungry eyes. Hallelujah. Amen. Be blessed. Have a great week. Put a smile on somebody's face this week. In Jesus' name, amen.